America, America, God mend thine every flaw, confirm thy soul in self-control, thy liberty in law. O oh, beautiful for patriot dream that sees beyond the years, thine alabaster cities gleam undimmed by human tears. the Battle of the Bulge was going on in Europe, the 8th Army, commanded by General Robert L. Eichelberger, was battling stiff Japanese resistance on Leyte in the Pacific. The fight for Leyte would continue for months until nearly 50,000 fanatical Japanese would be annihilated. It isn't easy knocking those Japs out of their positions. They're hidden in trees behind revetments, buried pillboxes, bomb-proofs, bunkers. getting them out of places like this. We can never be sure where their snipers are placed. We take it slow, easy. is giving us plenty of trouble. We have orders to clean it out.
is hit. At night, the Japs would swim out to our wrecked amphibians and set up machine guns. They got a few of us before we got them. By this time, we know the Japs are licked. They must know it, too. There's still strong resistance. Nip suicide snipers tie themselves up in the trees and take pot shots at us. We hit them, but they don't fall. Just die and hang there. A light tank moves up the airstrip. Our boys is wounded during the attack on the airfield. Another Marine goes out after him in a jeep under heavy machine gun fire. The chaplain's assistants tend the dead, removing the lower identification tag and leaving the duplicate on each Marine so there'll be no mistake later on. Sometimes we actually have to dig the Japs out of their holes. The island is infested with buried pillboxes, many of them still crawling with Japs. These bunkers were so constructed that heavy shelling and demolition charges failed to crumble them. Many of them were over 20 feet deep. Our first prisoners. This is the price we have to pay for a war we didn't want. Burial aboard ship for Marines killed in action. As I stand here today, having taken the solemn oath of office, in the presence of my fellow countrymen, in the presence of our God, I know that it is America's purpose that we shall not fail. In the days and the years that are to come, we shall work for a just and honorable peace a durable peace, as today we work and fight for a total victory in war. We can and we will achieve such a peace. Stemming von Rundstedt's drive into Belgium, Yank troops move up against heavy German counterattacks. All along the way, wrecked American equipment attests to the fury of the Nazi attempt to stall the Allied offensives toward Cologne and the Tsar. Allied military government men shepherd civilians from areas under fire to comparative safety at the rear. Meanwhile, the front lines need vast quantities of ammunition and other supplies to stop von Rundstedt's drive through the dense forests and rocky hills of the Ardennes. To prevent infiltration by the Nazis, mines are placed in the wooded country along the roads. Roadblocks are set up. One light tank is camouflaged as a haystack. Troops scatter through the field searching for Nazi paratroopers, drop behind our lines to disrupt communications. An abandoned parachute equipment container and a white snow cape are picked up. The Nazis tried every trick, even dressing their troops in captured American uniforms it was necessary for MPs to halt our own troops and check their credentials. The first few days found the weather perfect for von Rundstedt's thrust. Allied planes were grounded and the infantry had to fight it out alone. But 
fact, as soon as the weather broke, the eagerly awaited air support arrived. The huge bombers roared over Nazi positions and dropped thousands of tons of bombs. Bombardiers attack an important road junction choked with enemy supply trains. The RAF alone dropped an average of 10,000 tons every 24 hours on German positions. Patton's armor races madly to the relief of Bastogne, where parts of the 9th and 10th armored divisions and the 101st Airborne, tough paratroopers and glider men, were surrounded by the enemy. Dug into hillsides, they eagerly welcome supplies delivered by fleets of air transport planes. Fifteen hundred tons of supplies were parachuted to the besieged defenders. New supplies of ammunition are put to work immediately. And now the Nazis begin to feel the renewed might of Bastogne's defenders. Enemy equipment is shattered and many prisoners are taken. This is Bastogne, the town that General McAuliffe refused to surrender. Smashed American equipment testifies to the courage of its defenders. It's only fair that we should send them more. Iwo Jima, 750 miles south of Tokyo. Navy films show phases of the three-day bombardment prior to amphibious invasion of the eight-square-mile island. Naval assaults on Iwo actually began early in December with several softening-up shellings preceding present operations. Carrier-based aircraft also give strong support. They attack in the area of Mount Suribachi, 550-foot volcanic cone at the island's southern end. A natural fortress honeycombed with pillboxes and caves containing formidable gun emplacements. In addition to the carrier strikes, Army bombers hammered EO for 72 days. On 16th February, carrier planes pounded targets at Tokyo and Yokohama, partly as a diversion for the EO landings three days later. transport area. Admiral Nimitz announces that more than 800 ships of all types participate in the EO assault. An estimated 40,000 Marines are ready to hit the beaches. Opposing them is a Jap garrison of 20,000 men. Landing craft rendezvous on D-Day, 19th February. bombardment of the beach area continues, augmented by an intensive close-in cover barrage delivered by LCIs. A warship is hit. The enemy is employing dual-purpose guns. 120 millimeter mortars and his new 1100 pound rockets. Elements of Lieutenant General Holland M. Smith's Pacific Marines approach the eastern beaches of Io. Four initial landings are made just north of Suribachi and further up the coast. The 4th and 5th Marine Divisions each send two regiments with the vanguard force. H hour is 0900 and the landings begin as scheduled. Treacherous volcanic sands bog down our equipment. From the ridges, a Jap barrage hampers unloading operations. One of the
the shells hit this LCI. Among the casualties is a Navy combat cameraman who photographed several of the preceding scenes. Support landings. Additional waves drive shoreward in the face of heavy mortar fire. Preliminary bombardment has driven the enemy from his beach positions and results in relatively light opposition through the early stages of the advance. However, casualties are reported to be high among exposed beach and shore parties responsible for bringing up supplies. The loose, brittle volcanic cinder which forms the surface of this island makes difficult the use of ordinary mechanized equipment. It's reported that even the jeep is unable to maneuver. Only the LVTs are found effective in hauling supplies. Resistance grows as the Marines push across the narrow isthmus with the objective of isolating the Mount Suribachi area at its southern tip. Above the beaches, the enemy is entrenched in caves and dugouts 30 to 40 feet deep. Two-story pillboxes and blockhouses often buried in the volcanic deposits. Jap resistance is described by the Navy as the most fanatical yet encountered in Pacific warfare. Foot by foot is the bitter and bloody story of the advance on Iwo Jima, whose eight square miles cost 4,100 American lives and total casualties of 20,000, half as many as all previous marine operations in the Pacific combined. Navy and Marine Corps pictures show alligators grinding their way forward for the first assault on Mount Suribachi, whose guns command most of the island. Its capture is vital, and Navy planes roar into the attack. Marines dig in for the big push up the mountain behind a curtain of dive bombing. Big guns of the fleet offshore join the pulverizing barrage. On shore, howitzers hammer the Japs holed up in Suribachi's countless cave. The summit of Suribachi is now in range of concentrated land fire. The slow, agonizing crawl begins under merciless Jap fire, and pockets must be cleaned out with grenades. Twenty-two thousand Japs died in the fanatical defense of Io against marine courage that would not be denied. Few prisoners were taken in the 27-day struggle. Literally thousands of foxholes and pillboxes had to be taken before Io was ours. The fortifications of the Jap bastion make even more incredible the epic of marine achievement. But take it they did, to their everlasting glory. The blood-soaked volcanic ash will live forever as their monument. Our forces were spreading out in the Philippines. Sixth Army troops landed on Luzon in the Lingayen Gulf and swept southward to capture Tarlac, only 65 miles from Manila. Fifteen days later, men of the 1st Cavalry Division fought their way into Manila. Army in northern Luzon. Field artillery units and troops of the 25th Infantry attack Jap positions in the Lupau and Umingan areas. In this action, roadblocks are established south of the town of Umingan, which give our forces complete control of the last remaining highway in the north central plain.
stalkers fired point blank produced Japanese pillboxes. Wreckage of a Jap convoy caught in a roadblock and wiped out by artillery. Eight tanks, 20 trucks, and 805 millimeter guns were destroyed and 54 enemy troops killed. Tank units and troops of Major General Vern D. Mudge's 1st Cavalry Division dismounted crossed the Angat River at Bustos. This is the last important water barrier between the central Luzon Plain and Manila. General MacArthur watches crossing operations. The Angat River is a wide stream that winds down from the hills northeast of Manila and flows into the Pampanga River near Kalumpit where a bridgehead had previously been established by elements of the 37th Division, also advancing southward on Manila. Units of the 1st Cavalry Division, after overcoming sporadic Jap resistance in the Floridel and Malolos areas, run into an enemy roadblock in the hills about 12 miles north of Manila. Despite this delaying action, our troops push ahead. On 3rd February, troops of the 8th Regiment, 1st Cavalry, enter Manila at Grace Park on the northern outskirts of the city. Spearhead columns turn into the Avenida Rizal and move swiftly on the concentration camp at Santa Toma University and the Malacanan Palace on the north bank of the Pasig River. Filipinos turn out to give our troops an enthusiastic welcome. Taking part in the celebration, troops fill helmets and glasses with beer tapped from a nearby brewery. The American flag is raised at Santa Toma University in the city of Manila. The university, used by the Japs as a prison camp, was seized by units of the 1st Cavalry Division, 1st American troops, to enter Manila. Internees at Santa Toma sign the identification register for shipment out of the area. At least 3,700 Allied nationals, most of them American civilians, were freed after three years internment. As food allowances dwindled, the death rate in the camp increased sharply. After our tanks broke in, guards held more than 200 internees as hostages for 34 hours while the camp commander bargained for safe conduct of the Jap garrison. Shells from Jap heavy mortars and three-inch guns blast the grounds and buildings of the university, which was under artillery attack for several days after its liberation. American guns massed in the university yard fire against enemy artillery positions. civilian casualties are suffered from the Jap shelling. Block-to-block -block street fighting rages in the Rosario suburb of Manila as troops of the 1st Cavalry Division and the 37th Infantry Division join to mop up Jap snipers and small resistance groups in the northern sections of the city. The enemy uses mortars, rockets, and artillery to hinder our advance. Riflemen and machine gunners cover patrols, ferreting out Jap snipers. Filipino girl gorilla. Buildings are mined and fires started by the retreating Japs. Civilians flee from the burning building, salvaging furniture and household goods. Although few persons are injured by the fires, thousands are made homeless over wide areas in the northern part of the city. While inhabitants try to save a few prized possessions, looting adds to the terror and confusion.
Jap atrocities in Manila. Men, women, and children suspected by the Japs of being relatives or aiding Filipino guerrillas are tortured, killed, and burned, their bodies thrown into this concrete culvert near a railroad station. Filipino collaborators rounded up by the guerrillas. One of them carried maps showing the burned area of Manila and locations that were to be fired by the Japanese. The collaborator is led through the streets of downtown Manila. Beleaved prison in the heart of Manila. Liberated American servicemen dig in the prison courtyard to find the regimental colors which they buried in the first days of their imprisonment, shortly after their capture at Bataan. General MacArthur visits Beleaved prison. He assured internees that every facility of the armed forces is being devoted to the care and attention of those who've been rescued. Fires in Manila's ruined dock area. The Japs, unable to hold the city, attempt to destroy it completely. Amphibious vehicles and infantry of the 37th Division under the command of Major General Robert S. Beitler move up for a crossing of the Pasig River into southern Manila, last remaining Jap stronghold in the Philippine capital. Entry into the southern part of Manila is delayed by Jap demolition of all four bridges across the Pasig River. Troops of the 1st Cavalry Division later join forces with the 37th Infantry to encircle the Japs and compress them into a narrow pocket at the river's mouth. Elements of the 11th Airborne Division also participated in this encircling movement. back toward a last stand at Intramuros, the ancient walled part of the city of Manila on the south bank of the Pasig River. Intramuros has set a fire in the Jap suicide stand against American troops, closing in on the remnants of enemy resistance. Flames from the burning area light up the sky by night. Our troops advance into the stubbornly defended walled city, one building at a time. The Japs are unable to maintain continuous fire against infantry units, but slow down our progress with machine gun and sniper fire from concealed positions in walls, windows, and rubble. a fire trap set by the Japs in Intramuros. The men withdraw along the Avenida Rizal under heavy machine gun fire and grenade attacks. Japanese resistance concentrated in public buildings and city landmarks is systematically reduced by artillery fire. Dozens of enemy guns ranging from 20 millimeter anti-aircraft guns to 155 millimeter pieces are knocked out in counter fire against Jap artillery positions. American shelling drives the Jap troops into the open. They dash for shelter across an open plaza. Burning Manila, free after three years of Japanese control. The capture of Manila included the Santo Tomas prison camp. Along with the Filipino people, 
these prisoners had waited in long and quiet agony for this moment of liberation. Of all the liberated peoples in the world, none showed more gratitude than did the Filipinos. They well knew we had come not for conquest, but to keep a solemn promise to return and destroy the aggressor who had taken over their homeland in a war of conquest. Less than two years later, the Philippines would be given complete independence as a sovereign nation by the United States. Thirteen days after the fall of Manila, our airborne troops landed on Corregidor two years and nine months after the Japanese had hauled down our flag. It had been a long and bloody road, but we had returned. Who and where were those who once had said the American was no soldier? that he would not fight. I see that the old flag staff still stands. Have your troops hoist the colors to its peak and let no enemy ever haul them down. Driving through terrific storms, task forces of the Pacific Fleet roam the seas about Japan's homeland, steadily cutting down her remaining power to wage war. Sure of their superior strength, carrier forces boldly attack Tokyo and run down Jap convoys along the sea route between Nipponese supply bases and enemy troops in Borneo, Singapore, and other isolated garrisons. It's dirty going in these winter gales, but through storm or calm, they're out to cut the enemy's lifeline. Planes warm up for a hazardous takeoff through wind and rain. Over the target, they go in for the kill. But the main target is Tokyo itself. Here, the supply lifeline is cut at its source. Planes from Admiral Mitchell's famous Task Force 58 conquer fighter plane opposition. Navy and Marine pilots in three days destroy 817 Jap planes. We lost but nine fighters. Navy combat cameramen film these dramatic scenes of the attack on the heart of Japan. A strike that first hit Tokyo in the early morning hours when her armament plants were buzzing with industry. This is what the boys call the Mitcher Shampoo. A huge aluminum plant is the next customer to get the hot towel. Daring attacks such as this crippled Japan's entire war industry. All around the world, climactic events were swiftly gaining momentum. Our Ninth Army, under General Simpson, crossed the Rhine on the 2nd of March. Four days later, General Hodge's First Army occupied Cologne. Four days after that, 300 of our superfortresses blasted Tokyo. On the 17th of the same month, General Patton's 3rd Army had taken Koblenz. The next day, and half a world away, our troops invaded Panay Island in the central Philippines. Three days after that, Patton's 3rd Army crossed the Rhine. Four days later, General Eichelberger's 8th Army was landing on Cebu in the Philippines. Less than a week after that, on the 1st of April, 1945, 
the United States 10th Army under General Simon Buckner invaded Okinawa. On the 11th of the same month, the 2nd Armored Division of the 9th Army reached the Elbe, only 63 miles from Berlin. The 3rd captured Coburg. On the 12th of April, death took the Commander-in-Chief, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. He had lived to see the triumphant advances of American arms, but fate had denied him the satisfaction that final victory would bring. Harry S. Truman was sworn in as president. On the very eve of victory and its disturbing aftermath, his was the heavy duty of carrying on with the leaders of America's allies. On the final lap of their drive on Berlin, Russian troops under Marshal Zhukov and Rosakovsky send the Germans reeling. Cossacks are in action, too. In every city and town, the Nazis fight back with furious desperation. The foe must be wiped out building by building, street by street. Nazi rear guard action is fanatical as they try to stem the red tide. Watch this soldier. A sniper gets him. A machine gunner smokes out the sniper's nest. Another bag of Nazis is moved to the rear, and the townsfolk sees a chance denied them for years. The protection of red soldiers is all that saves the prisoners from a vengeful people. Left in the wake of the onrushing reds is the ruined city of Warsaw, scene of an indescribable five-year reign of terror. During occupation, even trolleys were for Germans only. The immortal Chopin's home was systematically destroyed in demented defeat. But at last, the exiled population, those still alive, are able to return to the shells of their former homes. For once more, the Polish flag flies over Warsaw. Mussolini is dead in a howling mob in Milan, where fascism was born, provides the sordid finale as it attempts to vent its rage on the body of sawdust Caesar and his followers, executed a short time before by Italian partisans after a summary trial. Signal Corps cameras record the blind fury of a people whom he led to disaster after promising them an empire through 20 strutting and corrupt years. The final degradation. Mussolini and his mistress hang from the rafters of a gas station as Taracci, one of his hangmen, goes up. There are none to mourn. The sawdust has run out of Caesar. Less than a month after President Roosevelt's death, Germany surrendered. Hitler was dead by his own hand. President Truman officially announces the end of German resistance. This is a solemn but glorious hour. I wish that Franklin D. Roosevelt had lived to see this day. General Eisenhower informs me that the forces of Germany have surrendered to the United Nations. The flags of freedom fly all over Europe. For this victory, we join in offering our thanks to the providence which has guided and sustained us through the dark days of adversity and into life. 
victory in Europe brought wild rejoicing throughout the Allied world as the big three announced the downfall of Nazi Germany. New York celebration is typical of the nation's joy at the end of nearly six years of war in Europe. It's a great day as a thankful people let loose their pent-up emotions. There is a hard road ahead before we bring Japan to her knees, and it's up to us to get back on the job until complete victory is assured. The Red Schoolhouse at Reims, France, as peace is signed with German General Yodel acting for the remnants of the Nazi government. Yodel, for a few hours, was the chief of staff of the German army while de Fuhrer's successor, Admiral Goeritz, was strangely missing. This is the news that electrified the world, unconditional surrender. In the temporary headquarters of General Eisenhower, as terms are laid down, with the Supreme Commander represented by General Walter B. Smith, nothing could be more symbolic of the downfall of the Third Reich than this abject surrender. Let us not forget Germany, but meanwhile, let us fight to quick victory over Japan. To his home shores, General Eisenhower returned in triumph. But in the Pacific, a war was still going on. A big and bitterly fought war, with the end not yet in sight. Okinawa was a bloody battleground, as our 10th Army was finding out. dead of a combined army and marine force marked the grim battlefield of Okinawa, where one of the bloodiest engagements of the war is being fought. Thousands of Yanks have been wounded, and other thousands have sacrificed their lives to drive a fanatical foe from this vital base, the doorstep to Japan itself. A canine hero suffers a wound, spotting ambushed Japs, but collects a souvenir. Along the Jap's southern defense line between Naha, Shuri, and Yonabaru, the Yanks advanced slowly, facing one of the fiercest artillery barrages of the war. In a few hours, the enemy poured 10,000 shells into a front of only 9,000 yards. Each small advance is gained by sheer grit in the face of withering fire from a suicidal enemy being slowly hammered back into the hill. The enemy defense line across the island is forced back and flanked at both ends by the dogged attack. Cautiously advancing on the firmly dug in enemy, Yanks plant a heavy charge of dynamite. <laughs> Dummy tanks are left behind by the enemy, retreating into the defenses of Naha, under attack by our big guns. The going is brutal and our casualties are high, but Okinawa stands squarely across the road to Tokyo and the China coast. It's the next big step toward victory over Japan, a victory that can only be won by work, war bonds, and heroic sacrifice. It took us 82 days of continuous fighting to take Okinawa.
All the military might of the United States would now be concentrated on the Japanese homeland. A tough job lay ahead, a job that would take men and equipment. Our entire military strength was now aimed at the one remaining Axis partner. Swarms of B-29s and carrier task forces carry destruction to the Japanese homeland. These and the following scenes of the opening of the final assault on Japan were photographed by newsreel, Navy, and Signal Corps cameramen. Our military planners estimated that in an all-out assault upon Japan itself, our invasion forces would probably suffer a million and a half casualties. But a new and terrifying force had come into the world, which was to prevent those million and a half casualties, the atomic bomb. Two of these awesome weapons dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki brought Japan to her knees. The president reports on the startling developments that sealed Japan's fate. We are now prepared to destroy more rapidly and completely every productive enterprise the Japanese have in any city. We shall destroy their docks, their factories, and their communications. Let there be no mistake, we shall completely destroy Japan's power to make war. It was to spare the Japanese people from utter destruction that the ultimatum of July the 26th was issued at Potsdam. Their leaders promptly rejected that ultimatum. If they do not now accept our terms, they may expect a rain of ruin from the air, the like of which has never been seen on this earth. Behind this air attack will follow sea and land forces in such numbers and power as they have not yet seen and with the fighting skill of which they are already well aware. Generalissimo Stalin from Lenin's tomb in Moscow's Red Square reviews his troops. The Russian decision to join in the effort to achieve quick victory over Japan was made before the release of the news concerning the atomic bomb by President Truman. With that mighty blast on the New Mexico desert, a new era in civilization has begun, and the doom of Japan is sealed. For this is the first test of the atomic bomb, which was later to wipe out the cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki and drive the Japs to surrender. These official U.S. Army pictures were taken from six miles away, and a Paul scientist saw a column of smoke soar 40,000 feet into the stratosphere. The atomic age, for better or worse, is here. The day of days for America and her allies. Crowds before the White House await the announcement from the President that the Japs have surrendered unconditionally. I have received this afternoon a message from the Japanese government in reply to the message forwarded to that government by the Secretary of State on August 11th. I deem this reply a full acceptance of the Potsdam Declaration which specifies the unconditional surrender of Japan. In the reply, there is no qualification. Reporters rush out to relay the news to an anxious world and touch off celebrations throughout the country. Washington is jubilant. And in Chicago, more than a million sing and dance in the streets in the biggest celebration the Windy City has ever seen. Joy is unconfined. It was 4 o'clock Pacific time in San Francisco when the announcement came and people were quick to leave their offices for an impromptu, spontaneous celebration. But it was in that city's Chinatown where Victory Day was the most joyous. Firecrackers that had been hoarded for years are set off in a triumphant roar. <laughs> Seattle let loose all the pent-up emotions of three years and eight months of war. And to the victors, 
the spoils. The pose may not be dignified, but the young lady is not the least upset. Peace, it's wonderful. The Navy photographer gives us a preview of Admiral Halsey's ambition to ride the Emperor's white horse through the streets of Tokyo. Their rallying cry is, go to it, Admiral, and so stay we all of us. But the greatest, wildest celebration of all was in New York's Times Square, where two million people, by far the greatest in the city's history, filled the streets all day, waiting for the official word. A hilarious, happy throng, they cheered every rumor that it was all over. And when President Truman's announcement came at 7 o'clock, the lid really blew off. Tens of thousands of proud American flags dotted the square, and as the day wore on, hilarity reached a high peak. Far into the night, the happy crowd screamed their relief at the end of the greatest war in history. New York never celebrated like this before, but never did they have a better reason. On the 2nd of September, 1945, Japanese officials signed the Articles of Formal Surrender on the battleship Missouri in Tokyo Bay.